So thank you, Carol. It's always a pleasure to be here. Um, so as, as, Carol, as Carol noted, uh, this is the 50th anniversary of the Landmarks Law, and I'm sure all of you know that, and, and that I'm the co-curator of this exhibit at the Museum of the City of New York uh, called Saving Place, um, uh, 50 Years of New York City Landmarks, which I co-curated with, with Donald Albrecht, who's a curator at the Museum of this, uh, as the architecture curator at the Museum of the City of New York. As Carol mentioned, the show was supposed to close the second week in, uh, in September. Actually, the show has been extended through the end of the year, but I highly recommend that you go before September 13th because a lot of the architectural drawings are probably going to disappear um, af after that date because a lot of a lot of uh, archives are not going to extend the loan because drawings, of course, because of light, they can't be on view for too long. So, so if you haven't seen the show yet, go uh, before the second week in September. When Carol asked me to speak about the exhibition and the book, uh, I hesitated because. Landmarks is not specifically a skyscraper story, uh, and I like to. I wanted to make the talk sort of site specific, so I, I talked with Carol about this, and I thought about what I could talk about. So there are two issues that I'm going to talk about uh, this evening that that deal with skyscrapers. One focuses on the topic of what I wrote my. Oh. There, there's the exhibit, and there's the book. I think we'll go back to the exhibit. Uh, the exhibit was designed by um, the same firm that designs a lot of the exhibits uh, here, by Wendy, what's her last name? Evans Joseph. By Wendy Evans Joseph. Uh, and uh, so there's a good connection between this exhibit and Skyscraper Museum um, exhibits. So there are two things I want to talk about. Uh, one is the um, issue of when did the Landmarks Commission designate what? And, uh, especially in the early years, and this is something that I talk about in my essay that's, that's in, in the book. It's something I became very interested in, wondering about what did the commission do once there was a landmarks commission? I mean, what did that mean to have, to have a landmarks commission? And the other thing I want to talk about is our Marcel Breuer and, and um, Grand Central. Uh, one of the things I'm most pleased about in the exhibit is that we have four of Breuer's drawings for the towers that he proposed on top of Grand Central. Uh, and I don't think that they've been on view since the day of the Landmarks uh, he uh, hearing uh, about that uh, proposed addition to Grand Central. So it, it was really interesting to actually see what, what Breuer was, was proposing. Actually, there are three schemes that, that Breuer proposed. Um, most people attuned to New York City preservation and indeed preservation in America in general are familiar with Grand Central and the Supreme Court decision that upheld landmark designation and the decision by the LPC to reject the Penn Central Corporation's plan to build a tower designed by Breuer on top of Grand Central. Uh, but that's about all people know. And actually the story, uh, I think people, I didn't, I didn't fully understand the story. Um, and um, so I'm going to share with you um, a little bit about what happened there. So, so on April 19th, 1965, Mayor Robert Wagner Jr. signed the law that created the New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission. But what did this mean? The Landmarks Law was passed in response to citizen lobbying, especially in Brooklyn Heights and Greenwich Village, and the demolition of many important buildings, among them, of course, Penn Station, but also other buildings that maybe are less well known. The Brooklyn Savings Bank here uh, in Brooklyn Heights, one of my favorite lost buildings in New York. And of course the Brokaw Houses, which were demolished uh, during, during, uh, during Landmarks Week in New York. Uh, and they're the building that actually was the catalyst to get Robert Wagner to get the, the idea of a Landmarks Law off to the city council. If, and so we, we really owe it to the loss of the Brokaw houses on Fifth Avenue and 79th Street for, for actually getting the law passed. So, and of course many other buildings were endangered. The new commission was empowered to designate the exterior of individual buildings that were at least 30 years old and were of architectural, historical, or cultural significance, and also to designate historic districts, areas that according to the law had a sense of place. By September 1965, a commission had been established, there was a chair, there were commissioners, and there was a small staff that had been assembled. But now, what would they do? And I think this is a question that, we, that in hindsight, we have failed to ask. What did it mean to have a landmarks commission in New York? This was a really novel 
idea. So what would they designate? Would they designate the city's most famous and best known buildings? Would they dive right in and designate buildings that were endangered? Or would they be very careful about the fragile legal basis for the new law and only designate safe buildings that had owner support? So the first thing, of course, was to figure out, well, what, should, what, what constituted a landmark? And fortunately, architectural historians had been compiling lists for, for quite a long time, at least since the late 1940s. So there were lists of potential landmarks. And I would say that if you, if, and these, these lists survive, and if you read through the lists, which were put together almost entirely by architectural historians, they are either buildings of architectural interest or buildings that were very old. Those seem to be the criteria. Architectural distinction and, and serious age, like old Dutch farmhouses, um, were, were on the list. Um, so what would, it, what would the commission do when it now had the power? I was surprised by what I found out when I began looking at early designation calendars. I had assumed, as I think most people do, that early designations would include renowned buildings, such as City Hall, Grand Central, the Stock Exchange, the Woolworth Building, the Chrysler Building, the Empire State Building. These were things that I think most of us assume would have been the landmarks, that maybe the Chrysler Building would have been landmark number one. Um, but this was not the case at all. None of these buildings were among the first buildings designated. And the Empire State Building had to wait until 1981, the Woolworth Building until 1983, and the Stock Exchange until 1985. Although the new commission was clearly aware that the constitutionality of a law such as that in New York had yet to be tested in courts, they actually plunged right in and designated endangered buildings. Indeed, the first public hearing, every single building that was on that calendar was a building that was endangered in one way or another. Some were endangered by neglect, such as the Peter Kleiss and Wyckoff House on the left, and the boathouse in Prospect Park. Uh, these both, this is now, this was the, the Peter Kleiss and Wyckoff house was still in private hands. Uh, it was, as you can see, this is a photograph that was taken by John Barrington Bailey, who was commissioned to photograph potential landmarks. Uh, and so this was just before uh, the public hearing, and you can see the building is, is a pretty, pretty terrible condition. And it stood right on a mapped road. Uh, so the road could have been cut through at any time. And the boathouse, which now, if you've been to Prospect Park, you know is a beloved landmark that's been beautifully restored, was a complete wreck. Um, and so they stepped in uh, to, to, to deal with these endangered buildings. Some were endangered by impending vacancy. The Custom House was about to be abandoned as the Custom Service moved to the World Trade Center. That's the Commandant's house on the upper right at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, which was about to be abandoned by the Navy, and the, the future of its historic buildings were unknown. And this is Sailor Snug Harbor, uh, which was also threatening to move out of, of New York. So, so they, um, they looked at buildings that were in danger because they were soon going to be vacated. And also they, were, they looked at buildings that were about to be demolished. All four of these buildings had been sold to developers and all of them had designs uh, that, that were going to replace the building. The Friends Meeting House on Gramercy Park and the old Astor Library had both been sold to apartment house developers. Uh, the, um, the Jerome Mansion on the bottom left uh, had been sold for office construction and the Metropolitan uh, Opera House also for uh, office construction for the, garment, for the garment district. So all of these buildings were endangered in one way or another um, and and, and all of them were part of the first public hearing. There was strong opposition at that hearing to some of these designations. Interestingly, there's not a lot of news about what actually happened at that first public hearing because it took place during a newspaper strike. But fortunately, Margot Gale, who many of you will know as one of the great preservationists, she was at the public hearing and she wrote up a report on, on, on what transpired uh, during that day, and she didn't cover every single building that was, was heard, but she did give a, a, a sense of, the, the, of the, the tenor of that public hearing. So there was a lot of opposition, especially uh, among the, the, the new owners of these four buildings. Um, and and um, three of them were 
uh, were designated, the Friends Meeting House and the public and the uh, Astor Library. And of course, this the Friends Meeting House is now the Brotherhood Synagogue, and the uh, the Astor Library is now the public theater. So these, in fact, the Landmarks considered cons Landmarks Commission considered its first victory Joseph Papp's announcement that that he would reuse the Astor Library for the public theater because the land landmarking was not only about designating buildings, but about saving buildings, finding uses for them. The Jerome Mansion was designated as well, but in the law, if you couldn't make a 6% return on your investment, you could apply for a hardship. They applied for a hardship, they received it, the city had a year to find a new owner, they failed, and it was demolished. And the Metropolitan Opera House was never designated. It was the one building from the first hearing that they voted not to designate. Uh, I think it was partly because uh, it was the forces that were building Lincoln Center that were opposed to saving the Metropolitan Opera. Similarly with Carnegie Hall, how could we possibly support more than one opera house um, in New York? But all, and so, you know, the Rockefellers and the other powerful people that were supporting Lincoln Center were opposed to, to this, but also because the exterior was never considered a great beautiful thing, and it was the interior that was considered spectacular, and the commission did not at that time have the right to designate interiors. Uh, so the Metropolitan Opera, of course, was, was, um, was lost. So what about skyscrapers? None were considered in the first public hearing. The architectural historians involved with the formation of the Landmarks Commission were interested in tall buildings, uh, uh, at least to an extent. All this list making culminated uh, in a book called New York Landmarks that was written by Alan Burnham, uh, who would uh, le be later become a key member of the Landmarks Commission staff for many years. In that book, he included about two dozen skyscrapers among the list of worthy buildings. The list included traditionally styled skyscrapers such as the Woolworth Building and the Municipal Building, which you see here. Uh, it also included uh, <laughs> buildings that evinced uh, European modern aesthetic like Raymond Hood's McGraw Hill and Daily News buildings and Ralph Walker's Barclay Vesey building. Conspicuously absent from this list were the city's early skyscrapers from the 1870s through about 1900 with their traditional facades, which had long been denigrated by architectural historians in favor of the Chicago buildings that more clearly reflected their innovative steel structure and were devoid of historic architectural references. So none of these buildings, in fact, the Tribune building was lost after, after um, the Landmarks Commission was established. Indeed, the only skyscraper from the late 19th century that made Alan Burnham's list was the Bayard Building by Chicago architect Louis Sullivan. Also missing were the high art deco buildings, such as the Chrysler and the Empire State Building, as these buildings were intensely disliked by sophisticated historians <laughs> and critics, including those people that were involved with the Landmarks Commission. And it wasn't really until 20 years later that a younger generation got interested in, in, um, in art deco. In the second public hearing, held in October 1965, the commission considered 70 buildings in Lower Manhattan, three of which were tall office buildings. The first skyscraper, to, or the first steel-framed office building to be designated was the New York Evening Post building, an odd choice. As it is not a very well-known building, this subtle Austrian secession-inspired 14-story steel-framed building designed in 1906 by Robert Cohn at 20 Vesey Street is an example of the commission heavily weighted to architectural historians choosing a building for its sophisticated architectural value and designating it even over the opposition of its owner. Ironically, this would later become the home of the Landmarks Commission. When I worked for the Landmarks, we spent, I, I worked here um, in, in this building. Um, so this was the first building that you could argue was a skyscraper uh, to, to be designated. It was followed in the next, in February of um, 1966 by the municipal building, oops, by the municipal building, which we saw before. Um, and that was also heard at that second public hearing. The third skyscraper that was heard at the second public hearing was the Woolworth Building, which probably holds the record for the building that had the largest number of public hearings. It just kept on coming back and coming back and coming back, and the owners kept on being opposed, and landmarks kept on holding other new public hearings uh, uh, and until finally in the 1980s uh, they designated it, but they did not designate it in this early year. 
It is here that I think that the commission was reticent to designate over powerful owner opposition. The Woolworth Building and other major skyscrapers were not in danger of demolition, so the commission chose not to deal with them because they didn't, they, they were, there was opposition, the law was still on weak constitutional grounds, so they simply ignored most of these buildings. The only other skyscraper that the Landmarks Commission designated in its early years was the Flatiron Building. Uh, otherwise, they, they basically were doing uh, old houses, uh, public institutional buildings, churches, Upper East Side townhouses, uh, and, and not skyscrapers. The one exception to what I have said is the Singer Building. Although in his book, Burnham did recommend the Singer Building as worthy of preservation, when it was actually threatened with demolition, the commission did not act. In 1967, Demolition began on the Singer Building, and so this, like the Tribune Building, this is proof that you can have a Landmarks Commission, but it's never going to save everything. While the Commission would step in to designate and hopefully save smaller buildings, when it came to a building on the scale of the Singer Building, that commission, the Commission refused to act. Alan Burnham noted that, quote, if the building were made a landmark, we would have to find a buyer for it, or the city would have to acquire it. The city is not that wealthy, and the commission doesn't have a big enough staff to be a real estate broker for a skyscraper. Burnham here is referring to the hardship provision of the law, which meant that once the owner proved the hardship, the city had a year to find another buyer, that's uh, to become a real estate uh, operator, or to acquire the building itself. Uh, and so, um, so they had already lost on one hardship application, which is the Jerome Mansion. Uh, and they were not going to do this again. Uh, and they knew that they would have trouble finding a buyer. I have argued uh, um, often that this building is, was built as, a, as an advertisement for Singer and that these floors were so small they were never economically viable. Um, that they, they were tiny. Um, and so, you know, so who was going to acquire a building um, like, like this? So in general, skyscrapers were not a priority until the 1980s and 1990s when the commission began to catch up, designating the Great Art Deco Towers and the early skyscrapers near Park Row, as well as masterpieces elsewhere in the city. Although I have to say, it wasn't until 20, 2011 that the Great City Services Building finally became a landmark. So it took a long time to catch up with the major buildings uh, in New York. By now, most of the great pre-war skyscrapers are designated landmarks, and even a few post-war masterpieces have been designated. Most of the great commercial skyscrapers were designated after the Supreme Court upheld the designation of Grand Central in, a, in 1978. This decision, which gave, which gave firm constitutional basis for landmarking as within a jurisdiction's zoning powers, made it easier for the commission to designate buildings over owner opposition. Many people have noted that the commission was quite cautious in its early years about what battles to fight, and as we have seen with the Singer Building, some issues they chose not to fight at all. But with this new assurance, following the Grand Central decision, the LPC designated several dozen important skyscrapers. So let's look at the Grand Central issue. The exterior of Grand Central Terminal was designated a landmark on August 2nd, 1967. So that's two years after the commission was established. That was really shocking to me since Penn Station was, was, was such an important uh, aspect of the reason why the commission was, was established. I would have assumed Grand Central would have been done right away. This was done just months before the first public announcement that the New York Central Railroad, soon to become the Penn Central Corporation, was seeking proposals to build an office building atop the terminal. And I can't help believe that the commission knew that this was about to happen, and that's why they actually heard Grand Central when they did. The initial announcement, as reported in the New York Times, notes that the idea had been broached with landmarks and the reception had not been hostile. <laughs> but the saga really begins in June 1968 when British developer Morris Sadie and his Union General Properties Company announced their plan for architect Marcel Breuer's 55-story concrete and granite slab to be erected on top of the building. As Breuer noted, the tower would be, quote, floated above the waiting room. He claimed that it would provide a calm background for the landmark facade of the terminal and that it would work because there would be no visual, there would, because there would be a visual separation between the terminal and the new building. So here is the initial proposal. Here you can see it's floated above, it saves the facade, and there it is, that, you know, it's separated, so that's the idea of it's floating. This is a, 
image that was in the New York Times on the day of the announcement with Breuer pointing uh, at the design. Um, and this is a design for, for the new storefronts. Um, the tower would be anchored into the waiting room of the terminal, which would be destroyed. But as a trade-off, the concourse, which was deteriorated and covered in advertising signage, and many of you remember when it wasn't so long ago that, that they actually took it down, that the concourse would be restored. And I have to accent the fact that interiors could not yet be landmarks. So only the exterior of Grand Central was a landmark at that time. Now, of course, the, the interior is a landmark as well. Changes were also proposed to the ground floor storefronts that would now be the entrances to the new tower, and that's what the bottom right-hand drawing uh, is. The proposal was an expensive engineering tour de force with a central core in the waiting room supporting the cantilevered tower. Although four stories shorter than the Pan Am building, it would rise 150 feet taller since its ground, its ground floor was 188 feet above the street. Isabel Hyman, who's written a monograph on Marcel Breuer, says that there was competition between Breuer and, Marcel, and, and, and Walter Gropius, who designed the Pan Am building. And, and, and reading into what she says, Breuer would have just loved the fact that it was basically blocking the Pan Am building. And you can see here is the juxtaposition between there's the Pan Am building and there's Breuer's building. So these are among a group of, of drawings at Syracuse University. Syracuse owns the Breuer archive, and they're just, they had it for a long time, but they're just beginning to catalog it. And when I contacted uh, the archivist, uh, they, had, uh, not, they had discovered nine drawings. Uh, and and uh, so these are the drawings that came before landmarks uh, that, that um, I don't think have, have ever been seen before. Uh, one or two of them have been published. Um, th I think this one has been published, and there's another one you'll see that's been published, but most of the others um, have not been, been published. Opposition to this proposal was immediate. The article quotes Donald Elliott, Mayor John Lindsay's city planning chair, saying that, quote, it's the wrong building in the wrong place at the wrong time. Although there were substantial concerns about congestion in the subway and on the street, these are issues that are we're hearing now about the Grand Central area too. So a lot of this is so interesting because it's the same arguments that, that we're hearing now about the building on the corner of 42nd Street and Vanderbilt Avenue, about the rezoning in Midtown East. Um, you know, these, these issues just come back again and again and again. Although there were substantial concerns about congestion in the subway and on the street, city planning had no jurisdiction over the project because it was, as we would say today, as of right. So city planning could say whatever they wanted, uh, and they were, they were actually quite vocal, but they uh, had no say. Only the Landmarks Commission had a say in this project. On the same day as the announcement, Ada Louise Huxtable published a very thoughtful piece about the proposal in the New York Times. She, of course, was the architecture critic uh, for the Times. She looked closely at the issues of high land value in Manhattan and how this would impact on the character of the city. In a particularly prescient passage, she noted that if the air over Grand Central Terminal were not worth several hundred million dollars in building rights and income over the next 50 years, there would be no Grand Central Tower project. That solid gold air is there to stay. And if its superheated values continue to rise as anticipated in the coming half century, Manhattan could someday replace Fort Knox. And we haven't quite reached 50 years yet, but we know that, that these values have been rising and rising and rising. Huxtable appreciated the, what she said was the technical elan of Breuer's building and a certain suaveness to the design, but ultimately saw it as a shotgun wedding and what she called a grotesquerie. Give a grotesquerie to a good architect, she wrote, and you are going to get a better grotesquerie, <laughs> like a better mousetrap. Mr. Breuer has done an excellent job with a dubious undertaking, which is like saying it would be great if it weren't awful. <laughs> in later commentary, Huxtable became much more vehement in her opposition to Breuer's proposal. She, she said that in hindsight, this a few years later she wrote, that in hindsight she found the proposal monstrous. A Times editorial on the same day proposed that the proposal was announced, possibly also written by Huxtable, 
states that as architecture of the new tower soaring over the classical Beaux-Arts terminal like a skyscraper on a base of French pastry <laughs> has the bizarre quality of a nightmare. A food analogy also appeared in a talk of the town piece in the New Yorker, probably written by Brendan Gill. That refers to the building as an elongated meat cleaver descending on a prune souffle. <laughs> this is interesting because I don't know if anybody knows what a prune souffle is, but I sure have no image of that. The writer thought the project would be impossible to stop. That's interesting that, that the, the New York writer thought that it would be impossible to stop this project, noting that we have small hope that there will be any immediate reversal of the attitude now prevalent among urban officials that the right of real estate owners to make money when coupled with architectural and engineering genius outweighs the right of city residents and workers not to be driven batty. Ironically, the design was made public only a week before Breuer received the AIA gold medal, its highest honor. Breuer was so respected in the field that few architects would criticize the design on record. Although a Times piece noted that many had reservations, only Philip Johnson, of course, would go public, stating that hiring a very great architect to design the building isn't enough justification to build it in the first place. Not only was there opposition in the press, but it was clear that the Lindsay administration was opposed. The public opposition gave cover to the Landmarks Commission's decisions. In July 1968, the developers of the tower requested a certificate of no exterior effect from the Landmarks Commission. Now you need to understand a little bit about Landmarks permitting. Landmarks gives out three kinds of permits. The easiest permit to get is a certificate of no exterior effect, which means that basically what you're going to do is going to have absolutely no impact on the designated exterior of a building. Then they can give a, a certificate for minor work, which is you know if you want to repair your stoop, or they can go. You can go for a public hearing and you get a certificate of appropriateness. So it took a lot of good spa, I think, for Breuer and and the developing team to ask for a certificate of no exterior effects <laughs> here with this building. Uh, so this was rejected in September of 1968. So in April, 19, and and of course the the developer said this was outrageous. You know, uh, how how could they do this? Uh, because they were, they were preserving the exterior. Now one of the things that was most interesting is this is early in Landmark's history and I don't think people fully understood what a Landmark designation meant because Glenn Collins, who wrote most of the pieces in the New York Times about this, kept on referring to the fact that Landmark's was concerned with saving the facade and that was it, and not the three-dimensionality of the building. So if you take that reasoning that once Landmarks designates a building, only the facade is designated, then of course, I guess this had no exterior effect, although it certainly did down here. Uh, in, uh, but, but the Landmarks Commission uh, felt that it re was regulating the three-dimensional form of, of, of the building, so they rejected it. So in April 1969, a public hearing was scheduled that would include the original proposal plus an alternative plan. Arguing rather disingenuously, I believe, that LPC had rejected the initial proposal, which really wasn't true, they just rejected it as a certificate of no effect, Breuer presented an, interm, uh, a, a, an alternative known as Breuer II, which obliterated, actually known as Breuer IIa, which obliterated the front facade of the building. And as you can see here, uh, it, it saves the, uh, the concourse and it, it completely obliterates uh, the, the front. There was, said Breuer, always some question in the minds of informed people as to whether the exterior of Grand Central Terminal is worth preserving. So I always wondered who these informed people are. But this keeps on coming back, at ever, as, when it, as we'll see when it goes to the courts. One of the arguments they used was that informed people thought the building wasn't, was, was not uh, worthy of, of landmark designation. Breuer was optimistic about his new design. He was in Europe and he sent a cable to his office that read, I'm sure we can win with second project. <laughs> at, this, at the second public hearing, Breuer presented his two proposals, that is Breuer 1, which we just saw, and Breuer 2. And the Railroad's Council threatened to challenge the constitutionality of the law if, if one of these was not approved. At the hearing, I am Pei and the president of the Whitney Museum spoke in favor of the proposal, while Jacqueline Robertson, representing the Planning Commission, 
the AIA Committee on Design, James Marston Fitch, who founded the Columbia Stock Preservation Program, architectural forum critic Douglas Haskell, and city council president Francis X. Smith spoke in opposition. In her commentary about the hearing, Ada Louise Huxtable analyzed the problem that the city faced if it sought to get what it wanted in Grand Central, seeing how rejecting the tower proposal would be, as she said, the big gamble. Because if they were gonna reject this, there was clearly gonna be a lawsuit and the city could lose uh, the Landmarks Commission entirely. Um, meanwhile, <clears throat> it was clear that things were not going well uh, for, for uh, the proposal. So, um, the, the development team kept on asking for delays in making a decision. And they came up with what's often referred to as Breuer 2B. Now this is very confusing because people have, been, people have not understood the order. And in fact, unfortunately, Isabel Hyman's book gets it all mixed up, what the order was of these. So this is 2A and this is 2B over here. And you can see it got rid of the, the, these um, supports over here to create a uh, a, a, a somewhat more traditional um, entrance uh, to, to, to the building. So now we have three designs all together uh, for this. Finally, on August 26, 1969, the commission unanimously rejected both, all the proposals stating that to protect a landmark, one does not tear it down. To perpetuate its architectural features, one does not strip them off. Soon after the commission rejected Breuer's design, the Penn Central company and the developer filed suit against the city, claiming that the landmark designation was a taking of their property and the quality of the building was also highly debatable. The case was heard in New York's Supreme Court, the state's lowest level of courts. Before Justice Irving Saypole, there were many, many delays as the owners in the city negotiated a settlement. And finally, in November 1974, Roberta Gratz, then a critic for the New York Post, announced that a decision was coming soon and that the new mayor, Abraham Beam, who was initially less supportive of the Landmarks Commission, was considering withdrawing from the suit and permitting the skyscraper to be built under the condition that, that the owner's monetary damages that they were threatening the city with, $5 million, $8 million a year, uh, would, would be canceled. In January 1975, Justice Saypal voided the designation of Grand Central and agreed that there had been an economic hardship placed on the terminal's owner. He did not rule on the constitutionality of the landmarks law. It was only very specific to this one issue. The Beam administration hesitated to appeal the case and was considering de-designating the terminal. But according to Roberta Gratz, Kent Barwick organized the Municipal Art Society to oppose the de-designation. Jackie Onassis called Barwick and offered her assistance and she came to a meeting with Mayor Beam where she told the mayor how much her husband, John F. Kennedy, had loved the building. <laughs> and finally, and this, uh, Roberta thinks that this had a lot to do with Beam's change of heart. Finally, Beam agreed to appeal the case and it went before the appellate division where Justice Saypole was reversed in a vote of three to two. In 1977, the case moved to the Court of Appeals in Albany. By this time, the proponents of landmarking had understood the value of celebrities and of public events. A rally was held at Grand Central before the case was heard, where the mayor was joined by Jackie Onassis and a group of Broadway performers, including Jerry Orbach, Tammy Grimes, and Bobby Short. The Court of Appeals unanimously upheld the landmarks designation of Grand Central and issued a broad decision that placed landmark designation on par with zoning regulations. And then, of course, it went to the Supreme Court, preceded, of course, by the even more famous rally and train ride to Washington, uh, which you can see here, there's Jackie Onassis speaking at the rally, and there's Jackie Onassis and... Um, um, Mondale. No, it's, Mon it's Mondale's wife, whose name I have now forgotten. Joan, Joan Mondale, and Joan Mondale uh, with a cake in the form of, of, of Grand Central. Um, uh, Bess Meyerson was there also at this event, Brendan Gill, uh, lots of other people. This all culminated on June 6, 1978, with the 6-3 to three court decision, which now provided a firm constitutional base for preservation throughout the country. And if you go to the exhibit, we have the decision signed by Justice Brennan, um, who wrote the decision. The issue of air over low-scale landmarks has been one that has been recurrent at the Landmarks Commission. 
Over the years, proposals have been considered and rejected for towers above landmarks, including Hugh Hardy's proposal for the New York Historical Society, we're reading left to right, Jim Polshek's at the Metropolitan Club, Norman Foster's over the former Park Binet building on Madison Avenue, and most significantly, Edward Durrell Stone Associates' plan for St. Bartholomew's Church on Park Avenue. And this is, these are interesting because they're a mix. Some are, are really not very good architecture, uh, and some are okay, and some, like, like Jim Polshek's design, taken all by itself is, is a really beautiful building. But the question was, did it belong on the roof of the Metropolitan Club? Um, this is, of course, still a significant issue since air is even more valuable than Ada Louise Huxtable imagined in her 1968 column. Just last week, a prominent real estate lawyer, whom I often chat with about preservation and development issues, bemoaned the fact that preservation advocates were so opposed to tall additions to designated buildings, which he considered to be a fair way to save a building and promote growth. So here we have this very, still a uh, very controversial issue with people have different opinions about. So skyscrapers have played a key role in the history of the Landmarks Preservation Commission. Many are now revered city landmarks, and I am sure that some of the more recent towers will, some decades from now, be considered for such designation as well. So thank you. I am, of course, of course, happy to answer questions, but you have to wait for the microphone to ask your question. Are there questions? Um, um, at the beginning, you intimated, I think you might have even stated it, that the Landmarks Commission was struggling with skyscrapers. They actually seemed to have a bias towards older buildings that had certain characteristics. After the Singer building came down, do you think that impacted things at all? No, I don't think the Singer building did impact because they still didn't do very many skyscrapers. I mean, it, it, it was really shocking how few skyscrapers were done. If you compare the number of skyscrapers to the number of Upper East Side townhouses that were designated, you know, there was, there was an incredible imbalance. There were more Dutch farmhouses than skyscrapers that were designated, and I think, you know, we all think of them as such a key element of the, the built fabric of New York that, that uh, they would be the first things people would look at because that was so characteristic of what makes New York. But it, it wasn't some, and not something that they considered. And I think partly, and it's something that, I, it's an instinct I have, but I have no way of proving that it's, it's generational, that these, these uh, the leaders of the commission uh, Alan Burnham and and um, and others were were born uh, in the early 20th century. They grew up as skyscrapers were rising. Uh, they, they they weren't something that they were interested in. And also, most skyscrapers were not designed by the most prestigious architects. You know, there weren't many skyscrapers by McKimmey and White and Career and Hastings and the people that they were interested in. And when Burnham was interested in skyscrapers, it was the buildings like, like the Daily News building and the McGraw-Hill building, which actually were not designated at the time, but Burnham was interested in, at least. Uh, so, so the Singer building made no, made no difference. Uh, I, I, I've, all, I, I've stopped at 1970, and it would be, and, and it's something that I should do is just go on past 1970 and see what was what when did they actually, how many did they designate before Grand Central, and then there's the, the huge push under Ken Barwick, a new generation uh, comes in and is, is running the Landmarks Commission, and lots more skyscrapers get, get designated. I might just add on to that from my own experience, and I really do believe it's gener generational because I'm the generation that in the art history and architectural history field advocated for skyscrapers, or became interested in skyscrapers, and um, my professor, uh, Rosemary Blatter, was the one who did the first book on Art Deco. Um, that was a graduate symposium at Columbia, which was the first time that anybody ever undertook to do commercial architecture, uh, and skyscrapers were really not considered 
uh, a legitimate area for study at Columbia Art History at the time that I was uh, just beginning study. So it takes um, advocates of, right. uh, of different uh, building typologies in, in order to include them in the history. And Rosemary Blatter's book on Art Deco is still the best book that there is on, on, on the subject. And there's a similar story can be told with the early skyscrapers, you know, that, that it was, it wasn't until Sarah Landau comes along and starts doing research on these that she puts them on par, on, and in some cases even as more significant than the Chicago skyscrapers. Everything was focused on Sullivan and Root uh, and, the early, and the early skyscraper architects in Chicago and, and ignoring what was being done in, in New York, which was different but no less important. Well, and apropos to the orthodoxy of modernism that the Breyer building shows, that there was a large constituency within the field of architecture and planning for modernist slabs like that, that defined a Venetian uh, sensibility as well, what was high value um, architecture, high, right. high style architecture. So um, New York buildings did not fall within that definition. Andrew, what was the um, justification, the legal justification at all given to landmark somebody's private property? This is my property, hardship or not. I mean, you don't tell me what to do with my private property. And it's like Ted Turner said about colorization, I own the film. I well, I, I mean, partly it was the, the Bard Act, which um, was passed by the New York State Legislature in the mid-1950s, which gave local communities the right to designate um, private property, gave them the right to, to form landmark commissions that would designate. And what the courts, the courts relied very heavily on their precedent that allowed zoning, um, and that, that they saw this within the zoning power of the city, and that as long as you could use the building as it was intended to be used, or make a 6% return on your investment, which is within the law, which the law specifically states. So when they wrote the law, they, 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 they noted that you had to be able to make a, a return on, on the building. So that because of that, they said it wasn't a taking, and that if you couldn't make that return, then you could apply for a hardship. And there have been a few hardship uh, cases, the Jerome ha uh, Mansion, um, a synagogue on West 79th Street um, that was heard after it was sold to a developer, um, and, and maybe two or three other hardship cases. So it was, it was because there was an economic out in the law, uh, and it was part of the zoning that, that, that the courts found it legal. I may, might make it another addition. Something that I've been very interested in, uh, a distinction between zoning and landmarking in terms of municipal regulation in New York and, and generally nationally, um, is the difference between a public good and public safety. And, and zoning was really to protect public safety when it was first established, to protect light and air on the street, to protect against panic in the streets and fire um, through density issues. So the idea of public safety um, is something that protects life and limb, whereas public good is something that enhances uh, the, the experience of, of the city. And I think Landmarks is, is much closer or is entirely based on public good, which really doesn't have a precedent in, muni in municipal regulation. I think it's, it's very significant because of that and much undervalued in that distinction. Good point. Uh, if you would, just give us a point of reference. When was the Beaver House designated? When was the Seagram building designated? How, in relation to the Royer proposal? Um, they were, well, it's, um, Seagram was designated exactly when it turned 30 years old. So that would make it in about 1988. Um, or that's, or maybe off by a year or two. Uh, and Lever had been done a year or two before that. Uh, so from the, for, from the modern buildings, Landmarks has hit the major monuments of most of the major monuments. Lever House, Seagram, they more recently did Chase Bank, uh, and just within the last year they did the old Marine Midland Bank. That's the one on Broadway with the Noguchi um, cube um, in, in front of it. Uh, and, uh, and the Pepsi, the old Pepsi building on, on Park Avenue. 
But other than, but they haven't really gone beyond that. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of effort to get the old Union Carbide building on Park Avenue um, done, which was um, another Skid Moorings and Merrill uh, building that, that was, uh, the chief architect was, was um, a woman uh, whose name I usually remember, I've now yeah, forgotten. Uh, Natalie. Natalie Dubois. Natalie Dubois. Um, and, and um, you know, some thought given to what's the next, are there other modern buildings that are worthy of, of, of being done? So, so the, the great monuments of modernism, most of them have been, have been designated. Alcoa building on 42nd? Oh, you mean the, the Sony, Sacconia the Mobile building? Yeah. Yes, the Sacconia Mobile building was done on the exterior. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to ask the uh, Rockefeller Center. Rockefeller Center, is that a, a, a group or the, the, the RCA building? Yes, Rockefeller Center has been done. The whole, all of Rockefeller Center, all of Rockefeller Center was done in the, in the late 80s, I think it was done. And the GE building, what about the GE? GE building also That's on the block of in the 80s. Bars, right? Yeah, the GE building was, is a landmark. Uh, your comment about the uh, the center building as being not usable commercially because it was it had too small a footprint uh, struck my ear with the horrible irony of the repurposing of that kind of thing that, that's happening to the, the Woolworth building now uh, and that could had it survived that have been applied to the center building which would have had magnificent uh, I'm sure it could have floor, um, yeah, I'm sure it could uh, have. Apartments had, condos, whatever, had it survived long enough to be repurposed. I'm sure it could have been repurposed in, in, from, from our perspective today, but nobody was thinking about <laughs> that like, then. And, you know, living, downtown, living downtown, I mean, you know, no, <laughs> not at that time. I mean, nobody would have even imagined that. You know, unless you were an artist living in, 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 uh, in a loft in the South Street Seaport area, uh, nobody lived, lived down here. I'm a fan of a little building on Queens Boulevard in Elmhurst. It was designated a landmark in 2005, the Jamaica Savings Bank building, mid-century modern. Yeah. And then it was overturned by the city council. Yep. Is there any process for reconsideration? It's still standing. And it's still the, um, that, that's a really interesting, a really interesting um, issue because the Jamaica Savings Bank building on Queens Boulevard, which is a very funky, um, <laughs> Uh, kind of vernacular modern uh, modern building. Uh, it, is, it was turned back by the city council and it's an issue of, of education because when it was turned back, one of the city council members said, and I quote, bring us buildings that look like landmarks. So in other words, modern buildings, they didn't have a lot of, a lot of ornament on them, so they couldn't possibly be landmarks. So there's, there's and this is a really serious problem with, with with modern, with modern buildings. It could be heard again. In fact, the Jamaica Savings Bank in Jamaica, the old early 20th century one, I think was turned back twice by the city council before it was finally designated. Um, so it, it, it could be heard again um, and, and designated. Send, send in a letter to the Landmarks Commission. Let's see what happens. <laughs> I don't know, what, what's it, is it, what bank occupies it's it now? Bank of America now. They just did asbestos abatement. <clears throat> but the building is, is pristine, it's mm -hmm. beautiful. They yeah. We did the whole thing, it's nice. Mm -hmm. What about the White Castle? Oh, they tore that down. Oh, and really? Other questions? Any other questions? Well, I'll, I'll ask one about um, a, an endorsement for another skyscraper that needs to be protected. And you mentioned it at the end of your essay in the book. By the way, the books are over there, so you should be getting a book. Um, the Shelton Hotel. Oh yeah, the Shelton Hotel is the most conspicuous pre-war skyscraper that is not designated, and I don't understand why. Because there is no building that was considered more important in the history of zoning than the Shelton Hotel, which was generally considered the first building to ex to to use the zoning law in an expressive manner, uh, and it's now a Marriott Marquis or something. It's on Lexington Avenue, just south of Wal the Waldorf. Um, and it is, it is a beautiful building and so important in the history of, of zoning and, and skyscraper design. And also, 
it was home to Georgia O'Keeffe, who loved the building, and she painted it several times. There are a number of really great uh, uh, paintings of the building that she did. Unfortunately, none of her urban skyscraper paintings, which I think are her best work, happen to be in New York collections. They're all scattered um, in, in places like uh, Lincoln, Nebraska, and uh, Arkansas, and, and whatever. So, so yeah, I mean that that's high up. That's like number one or two on my list of undesignated buildings in New York. Well, in that case, well, let's um, carry the flag forward to the right. Shell Hotel and all New York. the Skyscraper Museum, and I want to welcome you tonight to a lecture that will celebrate the 50th year anniversary of the Landmarks Preservation Commission, uh, and is occasioned by the book that is the catalog for the exhibition called Saving Place, which is on view not here at the Skyscraper Museum, but the mu at the Museum of the City of New York through September 13th, so I hope you will go to see that exhibition. Andrew is, Andrew Dolcart is the co-curator for that exhibition, uh, and he has a very long history with New York City landmarks and architectural history. I think this has gone off now, is it? No, no, okay. no it's fine, yeah. All right. Um, Andrew is a, a good friend of long standing, as we like to say, rather than old friends, but we do go way, way back, and indeed this is um, one um, more lecture at the Skyscraper Museum, which has been going on in a relationship now for probably nearly the 17 years that the museum, since the museum was started. Andrew's always there when you uh, call on him to talk about New York City history or to speak about yet another of his, uh, his new books and his new publications. He has, uh, he is uh, an exemplary uh, historian and someone who has a long and deep history with New York City landmarks, having worked in his youth uh, at the commission on the, on the staff, on the research staff, having uh, been a consultant to them, having written many a designation report, having authored the first uh, guidebook to New York City landmarks, and, uh, and in, in the years now since he has been at Columbia, heading the Historic Preservation Program at the Graduate School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation, uh, he has been a, a friend and colleague of everyone who cares about the history of New York um, and the history of architecture. And indeed, tonight, we're celebrating the history of architecture uh, as part of American architecture because we're uh, being filmed here for uh, C-SPAN American History Channel. So I'm going to remind you that when we come to the question and answer period, you're going to use this microphone in my hand in order to project your important questions. So Andrew will talk for about a half an hour and he has framed his, um, his remarks around the history of the skyscraper and landmarks preservation and a special project that he'll talk about that he rather rediscovered and then offered up in, in special drawings the Marcel Breuer drawings for uh, above Grand Central Terminal, which were not realized, uh, but uh, mark an important, uh, in their association with Grand, Sur with Grand Central, mark a very important point in the history of the legal decisions that withheld preservation, um, not just in New York City, but in America due to a Supreme Court case. So I'm gonna let Andrew tell you about that history. Here's um, Andrew Scott Dolker. Thank you. 